This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. India Inc. comes here this week from Pondicherry. Pondicherry is a place more associated with spirituality and religion than business. But in this season of unusual business stories, we bring you the story of yet another unusual businessman, Dilip Kapoor and his company High Design. And the story of Dilip Kapoor begins right here in Pondicherry. My parents moved here in 1954 uh, into the ashram. And I spent 10 years in the ashram school. And then I went at the age of 15, I went to high school in America, and then college, and then PhD, and all that. And then I came back to Pondicherry because I love it, actually. Really what did like you do it. a PhD in? International affairs. Ah, yes, Nothing of to course. do with business. So international affairs, yeah. PhD, and you come back and you start making handbags. Well, that was um, part, partially a mistake, let's put it that way. What, the international I came back affairs? for Oroville, actually. Came back to live in Oroville. Um, but there wasn't enough happening there. So this was a hobby, and then the hobby got slowly over the first uh, 10 years. It got bigger and bigger and bigger until it was no longer a hobby, it was a business. And the hobby began how? In 1978, yeah. you come back to Oroville to do what? To, just to be part to of live. this experiment in international living and to make, um, uh, we thought the world was going to change. And so you start off as a hippie, and do you become a hippie partly because of your <laughs> alternative type of childhood, or...? Um, possibly. I just found it interesting, the questioning that was happening. I mean, I, um, I, wasn't, I was never really interested, and I never found it interesting, mainstream America. High design went from being just a hobby to a successful business. But in this, Dilip Kapoor's main factory, the atmosphere remains alternative in terms of its environmentally friendly atmosphere. It also remains a family business, albeit of the nuclear kind, with Dilip and his wife Jacqueline running the show. You know, it started as a hobby because I was pretty anti-business. Uh, but as it kept growing um, and became more and more successful and I was spending more and more time with it, uh, one day I suddenly realized I had three, four hundred people. I was working in five different houses which are full of my workers. It was, it was no longer a hobby. We first were selling essentially to all counter culture shops. You know, whether they were what you want to call them, hippie shops or, you know, gay stores or whatever. Anybody who was against the normal mainstream. Um, but then those people also grew up. I mean, one of them got jobs as a chief buyer of John Lewis. Uh, and he says, look, if I carry it, why can't I have it in John Lewis? And he bought it, and that was the first move into mainstream. So John Lewis was your first customer break, abroad? Break, no, 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 we were always selling. Until 2000, we were selling only abroad. India was just sort of the surplus. When did you actually start making a, a production unit type thing? I would say around 83 or so, when we would you could say that I was making at least 10 bags of a style or something instead of making one off and you know, just having fun designing. When did this factory come up? 1990. That's when I would say the business really started. Jackie, how did you meet Dilip? I met him in Oroville. I came here as a tourist and uh, a mutual friend of ours introduced us. And uh, the day he met me, he had Japanese buyers coming. And he said, I, they don't speak English, I don't speak Japanese, I don't know what to do. And my friend said, oh, that's not a problem, Jacqueline speaks Japanese, so you take her along as a translator, and that's how it all started. And how long ago was that? Uh, that's 17 years ago. And then, love at first sight, and marriage, marriage in a minute? Sight. Yeah? Well, I went back to Germany. I stayed another half year in Germany. I went and... Uh, came to India one more time, we traveled to Rajasthan, we went to America together, and then I moved here, and uh, that was it. And you've been involved with high design from the beginning? I arrived on a Tuesday, Wednesday morning, Dilip told me, you're the boss of the garment section now. So I said, okay, I'm the boss of the garment section, and that's how we started. It was a lot of trial and error, but... 
But the bags was already... The bags was delayed, and uh, he had started a small garment um, unit at that point. Uh, and uh, I remember we produced about 400 garments per month at that time. And uh, we brought it up, I remember the first thousand, and then it was 10,000, and that's... What is it now, the garment? Uh, well, at one point we produced 20,000 garments, but with the leather garments business uh, falling apart internationally, we're producing about 10,000 at the moment. Yeah. So this is, this is the house where you lived as a child? This is the house where my parents came in in 1954 when they joined the ashram. The first house and the last time my mother still lives here. And you lived here all your childhood? Uh, until the age of 15. And yeah. then I moved to America. And your father, what brought him to the ashram? He always wanted to be. He's uh, the original um, Indian sadhu, but modern sadhu. He and was he was satisfied with being here? He didn't want to do any business, didn't go back well, to the Well, he had a business, as you know, which is sold and and uh, what business was he doing he had can you believe it he had a shoe factory so he's in the jeans ah. but i never saw it so he had a shoe factory which he sold and came to pondicherry and yeah. never went back to business again no so your high design starts from scratch yeah right so right High Design has aspirations to become India's first international brand in leather goods. It's already a well-known brand in India. Dilip Kapoor has succeeded in ensuring that his company sticks to a form of tanning leather that causes less environmental damage. I think we have certain very clear ide ideological values which make us different from others. One is that extreme um, naturalness that we've always had, you know, the fact that we are very, very concerned that we don't want to cover the leathers with a lot of paint, which is what most companies do. Uh, we want to have the natural grain, we want the natural look of the leather. Uh, we see it as a very, very natural material, and that's uh, that we're very environmental conscious. Uh, you talked about the gardens. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to live in any other way. The same thing in our tanning. We were, I think, the pioneers. And we're still the leader in experimenting with vegetable tannings. You know, Explain and, that a little to me. Um, see, when you take a raw hide and you want it to become leather, you have to stop it from rotting, of course. So to do that, essentially, the commercial way to do it is through chrome tanning. We use chromium salts to stop it from doing that. But the traditional way was through using vegetable extracts from trees and barks and seeds and all that. Um, so we went back to that and started experimenting with that. People said with vegetable tanning, but the leather becomes so stiff, you know, we want it soft. But, you know, if you keep experimenting, you find your ways. You keep adding natural oils to it that gives you flexibility. So we've been doing that for a long time. 